This is Becca. This is Molly. We're here to talk about Jane Austen. We are, indeed. <laughs> well, before we record each episode, we record 15 seconds of silence for Graham, our wonderful audio engineer, to get the room tone. And I just decided that it would be a good time to meditate. And then when I opened my eyes, Becca was raising her eyebrows at me in <laughs> such a way that then I snorted and had to <laughs> count 15 more seconds. It was wonderful. She was meditating but not in the way that like I would she was just sitting sort of upright and breathing properly so she had her little like Rafiki hands out if anybody's seen the Lion King if anybody's seen the Lion King you know casual if anybody's seen that really um unknown indie film that was like underrated back in the Disney days the Lion King (laughs) the way Rafiki holds his hands while he meditates she was basically just doing that and I just look over and she's like frozen in place and I had to try so hard not to laugh and then we made eye contact and Molly just (laughs) lost it. Anyway, (laughs) time to talk about some Jane Austen. As you know from uh, the podcast, I've read Jane Austen, Molly hasn't and we're reading Pride and Prejudice for the first time together. For my first time. For Becca's hundredth time and let me tell you, I've remained spoiler free for 25 years of my life on these books and I don't know how but I got something, I I was thrown for a loop on these chapters. I screamed and then I went and it was Mother's Day and my grandma was on Skype with my dad and I went into the room and I was like, you guys are not going to guess what happened in Pride and Prejudice. And they were like, yes, we, we could probably guess. Because everyone else knows the plot of this book. This is what gives this podcast its snap, crackle and its pop is that Molly really doesn't know what happens. And I was so happy you did not guess this one. I really thought I was pushing too hard in the last episode to like hint at it. Uh, No. (laughs) Today we're going to be discussing chapters 9 through 11 of Pod Pride. (laughs) Pride and Prejudice. On Pod and Prejudice, we will be discussing chapters 9 through 11 of Pride and Prejudice. (laughs) So let's get right into it, starting with chapter 9. Lydia gets married. And she's coming home with Wickham. And Lizzie and Jane are both dreading this. Jane, mostly just because she feels so bad for Lydia, because Jane is Jane. Then they arrive. We've all had a friend whose significant other truly sucks. And it makes for very awkward encounters at parties. Truly. That's what this chapter is. And then they hear Lydia's voice first, as of course they do, because it's Lydia. And then she appears with Wickham, and Mrs. Bennett gives them both a very warm welcome. And then it's followed immediately by a not-so-warm welcome from Mr. Bennett. He basically just, like, stands there, lips pursed, like, staring at them, just like... (sighs) Remember, he didn't want to bring Lydia back. He never wanted to see her again, so he's not happy. (laughs) Yeah. My favorite line in this part was, Lydia was Lydia still, which says all that we really need to know. Basically, yeah, Lydia, like, here's the thing that's just happened. We spent the last two episodes of this podcast slash the last, like, what, five chapters, four chapters, absolutely flipping out for the sake of Lydia and her reputation and the fact that she was about to possibly ruin her life and the lives of all of her sisters all at one time. Lydia just isn't on that wavelength. No. She's just like, oh, yeah, I got married. And then she comes and she looks around the house and she's like, oh, everything looks exactly the same in like that bitchy way that you do sometimes. And Wickham is pleasant. And Lizzie thinks that had the circumstances not been what they were, he probably would have delighted them all as he used to. They used to love him. However, Lizzie knows that he's a prick and she resolves herself, quote, to draw no limits to the impudence of an impudent man. And I did look up impudent because I wasn't sure, but it means arrogance. So this is Lizzie being like, no, I know who he really is. I also love that you used the phrase prick because I know Jane Austen did not use that phrase, but it is so British. Oh, thank you. I have been watching Normal People on Netflix and well, that is Irish. Wait, I can I can sometimes do an Irish accent. I really don't want to offend our listeners, but... Well, everyone, when Becca was a senior in college, she was in a play where she had to do an Irish accent. I want to dance, Kate. It's the Festival of Lunas. I want to dance. What a what a play that was. That was a cool set. What a play. It was very depressing and very Irish. I, all I remember is you guys dancing around the kitchen. Uh, yes, fun fact about that play. I was supposed to be the best dancer. <laughs> like character wise in that cast and Molly's laughing because I am assuredly a terrible dancer you're not a terrible dancer but I'm still laughing at the prospect of it I used to do the acting all the time and I once went to an open dance call and like I I had 
so it was a musical theater audition. I'd like gotten the audition. I was so hype. I had a good like singing audition. And then they were like, great, go upstairs for the dance call. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then there's me just stretching like an old woman with arthritis and like eight or nine girls who clearly trained in musical theater we trained in like not musical theater we trained in theater and they're all splitting all over the place and just being like oh man like I just want to be loose for this you know it should be easy and then we all have to do this like combo and of course they put me in the front and I'm just trying to follow all the like dancer girls it was really like my worst fear come to life I really can't dance, is, is the moral of that story. Wow. Back to Jane Austen. Yeah, back to Jane Austen. So Wickham sits by Lizzie and acts like nothing is wrong. And Lydia keeps talking about how she had no idea she'd be getting married when she went to Brighton. But oh, how she thought it would be so fun if she did. And everyone's like, why are you bringing this up? But Lydia doesn't notice that they're all really uncomfortable. And she then asks Mrs. Bennett if everyone knows that she's married. And she says that when she was driving into town, she saw William Goulding in his carriage. His They call it a curricle, which is a kind of carriage. And she purposefully like rolls down her window and places her hand on the windowsill with her ring sticking out so that William Goulding will see it and know that she's been married. So to understand this from Lydia's perspective, basically, she decided it would be so fun if I eloped. Goes off. Has, like, a little excursion, but then just elopes and then comes back. And for everybody else, it's like, oh, our daughter went missing. Yeah. And she does not care at all. She fucking sucks. Again, Lydia, feminist icon or annoying twat? It's sort of a yes and scenario. Yes, and I'm leaning more towards the latter nowadays. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Unfortunate. Lizzie is so stressed that Lydia is acting this way that she just like gets up and leaves the room and she comes back later to hear Lydia saying to Jane that she must take her place at the table now that she's a married woman, which is and Lydia continues to just go on about how excited she is to show off her ring to the Phillipses and the Lucases and she goes and shows it off to Mrs. Hill I I did have a question how did Wickham afford to buy her oh wait we'll find out (laughs) I know who bought her the ring yes Uh, although I I have to imagine it's not the world's most impressive ring no it's probably understated but she's really proud of it so one of our friends and I always like quote this line from sex in the city back and forth to each other about a really ugly ring and it's like it was a pear-shaped diamond with a gold band (laughs) and I just picture that ring nice on Lydia's finger and her being like I married it's wonderful pride and prejudice but it's sex in the city it's not inconsistent then she tells her mom that her sisters should all go to Brighton for that is the place to get husbands and (laughs) Mrs. Bennett tells her she doesn't want her to move up north and Lydia says everyone can visit and soon she'll get husbands for all of her sisters and then Lizzie says I thank you for my share of the favor but I do not particularly like your way of getting husbands. This is the most (laughs) savage thing Lizzie has said the entire book. I died. Our patrons will see that my notes just say I'm dead. You know what? I take it back. It's not as savage as she was at Proposal Get-In. Sure, but this is savage in a better way. This is savage in a passive-aggressive way as opposed to a just straight-up aggressive way. Yeah, and I like this side of Lizzie. It's like back to her sassiness. Yes. So Lydia and Wickham are only staying 10 days, so Mrs. Bennett keeps throwing a bunch of parties, and everyone else enjoys these parties because, quote, to avoid a family circle was even more desirable to such as did think than such as did not and I really liked this way of categorizing the family because it puts like those who do think being Lizzie and Jane and Mr. Bennett and those who do not think being Lydia and Kitty. Kitty. <laughs> Mary thinks. I don't know which category Mary falls into here. I kind of just think Mary's like upstairs not paying attention. Yeah, Mary's not even at the party. But um, either way, like Lizzie and her dad and Jane are like, it's good. We don't have to be around Mrs. Bennett only like we don't have to listen to all of this stuff we can kind of it's a party so we can avoid that and then the other guys are like oh party yeah exactly Lizzie notices that Lydia likes Wickham much more than he likes her and she feels certain that his flight was rendered necessary by distress of circumstances Um, I'm assuming she means his debts and she's assuming that he was like run out by the money that he owed people and that he being who he is he wouldn't deny a companion on his travels so that's why he's married to her and Lydia one day asks Lizzie if she can tell her all about the wedding and Lizzie's like please don't but Lydia says I must so she launches into this tirade and we get to hear all about her wedding morning the wedding was supposed to happen at 11 a.m. 
And she was so nervous that something would happen to like delay the wedding. And she's getting dressed in the morning and she says that her aunt was talking and talking and that she wasn't listening. And I I really don't know why Lydia admits to these things, but she just doesn't care about other people's feelings. So she was like, I only heard one in 10 words of what she was saying. She has no filter, which is impressive in this time period. Truly. It's it's fun, but awful. I hate it. (laughs) She says in general, her uncle and aunt were horrid unpleasant the whole time she was there. Lydia, they took you in to their home and like gave you a place to stay. The reason that they're horrid is because this is a very unpleasant situation. Exactly. So the morning of the wedding comes and Mr. Gardner gets called away on business with a Mr. Stone. And Lydia gets so stressed that he wouldn't be back in time. But then he was. And then she says, however, I recollected afterwards that if he had been prevented going, the wedding need not be put off for Mr. Darcy might have done as well. Record scratch. My notes just say... Mr. Darcy give her away, and then what? (laughs) Oh, no, I went off the charts there. Sorry, (laughs) Graham. First of all, Mr. Darcy is there. Second of all, why would Mr. Darcy be the one to give you away? That doesn't make any sense, Lydia. An excellent fucking question. It's like, what? She just wanted to bring it up. And then Lizzie and Jane are like, what? And she says Mr. Darcy was coming to the wedding as well, but she wasn't supposed to say anything, so please don't tell anyone. Oh my God, Wickham is going to be so mad. And so Jane and Lizzie agree not to tell anyone, but Lizzie is so overcome by curiosity that she just runs away, which... Same, I guess. And she's so confused. Why would Mr. Darcy be at Lydia's wedding? So she writes a letter to Mrs. Gardner saying, basically, tell me why he was there unless for very cogent, meaning logical reasons. It must remain secret, dot, 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 dot. But then she says, there's no way that I'm going to be able to go on not knowing this. So... Quote, if you do not tell me in an honorable manner, I shall certainly be reduced to tricks and stratagems to find it out, which I liked. She's being honest. I think that just basically means ask Lydia and push her. Yeah, she's going to find out one way or another. So you might as well tell me, Mrs. Gardner. So she decides not to tell Jane that she wrote this letter because Jane is too good to go against Lydia's wishes to not know anything. And my final thoughts on this chapter at the end were, what the heck and a half was Darcy trying to stop the wedding? Why did Wickham let him come? They're not friends. No, they are not. So that's what I was thinking at this moment. Yes. And what in God's name is the response that Lizzie gets in the next chapter? Well, in chapter 10, Lizzie receives a letter back from Mrs. Gardner that is about like 17 pages long. (laughs) And Mrs. Gardner is surprised that Lizzie is asking, though this part was kind of confusing and I think we should probably come back to it after the letter, but she basically says she didn't think that this question would be necessary on Lizzie's part. She basically thinks Darcy told Lizzie. Oh. She she mm. didn't know Darcy was like trying to keep it a secret. I see. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. So she was like, if you are really ignorant and you truly don't know what I'm talking about, let me explain. But she she is shocked. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So Mr. Darcy visited Mr. Gardner the same day Mrs. Gardner arrived back in London saying that he had found Wickham and Lydia. So he had left Derbyshire only a day after they had left. So after that whole debacle, he was like, gotta go. He said that he felt personally responsible for what has happened because it was his own fault that nobody knew how shitty Wickham is. Due to his own mistaken pride. It's in the title. He had thought it beneath him to lay out his own private actions to the public and make it known that all of this drama had happened with Wickham. Therefore, it was his duty to fix this. Mrs. Gardner, I love this, the entire letter, she keeps hinting that maybe he has some ulterior motives in involving himself in this situation. I mean... (laughs) I mean, we know that he does, but I love that she keeps hinting it. And he thought that he could find Lydia and Wickham better than Mr. Gardner could because... He knew of a connection that Wickham had in London, being Mrs. Young, the old governess of our girl, Georgie. Baby D. So she was very close with Wickham, as we know. So Darcy goes and finds her out. Oh, oh, after Darcy had let her go, after the whole debacle with Baby D, she had started letting lodgings in London. So running like a hotel. Mm -hmm. And Darcy goes to her and she won't tell him at first But after several days and probably a lot of bribing, she tells them where Wickham is because he had come to her and then she sent them on their way somewhere else. So Darcy then goes to Wickham and then he insists on seeing Lydia. And his goal was to convince her to break off the marriage or whatever is going on at this point to break off the situation and go back to Longbourn as soon as her family will have her back. But she will not. 
So he decides instead then his duty is to expedite the marriage and make sure that it happens. Lydia, come on. Yeah, this is all just a lot. (laughs) Also, he finds out from Wickham that it was never his plan to marry Lydia. I mean, of course not. I think the only person who thought that was Jane and Jane is too sweet. Jane's Jane. Yeah. But also, I can't picture Wickham like being honest with Darcy at this juncture. Like... Darcy shows up and Wickham's just like, oh, yeah, I was never going to marry her, blah, 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 blah. Darcy knows Wickham pretty well. And I think there are ways in which, like, Darcy can sort of play on Wickham's weaknesses. And also, I think that Darcy might be inferring some stuff as well. For sure. Wickham admits that it was indeed his gentleman's debts that drove him out of town. And he, quote, scruples not which means he doesn't hesitate to lay all of the blame on Lydia for her leaving. Like, he was like, it was all her. She wanted to come with me, whatever. And then Darcy asks why he wouldn't marry Lydia right away if he was in that much debt, because even though she didn't have a lot of money, she could give him some sum to make him, you know, be able to live. And Wickham says that he still hopes to marry up. And then Darcy pays all of the debts. All of them. Do you remember how many times we talked in the last episode about How big a deal it was that Mr. Gardner paid those debts. Yes, and I had no idea how. I was, like, guessing that maybe Mr. Gardner was gambling or something to suddenly have enough money to pay these debts. Yeah. No, Darcy used his money to pay the debts for Lydia. (laughs) Graham, is there any sort of swoony music you can put here? Because I think that Molly is officially swooning over Mr. Darcy. I'm gonna cry. (laughs) Yeah, please, just some sort of... uh, I don't know, maybe, like, the equivalent of something that involves a chaiselon that uh, Molly can faint onto because Mr. Darcy has been a chivalrous gentleman and saved not the honor of the lady he loves, but her really shitty sister. And her whole family, by extension. And her whole family, who he does not care for. Exactly. To a man he hates. I just, it's so much. It's, wow. So Darcy then waits for Daddy Bennett to leave because he thinks that he'll have a better go of convincing Mr. Gardner that this is the right decision. And then he comes to Gardner and he tells him what he's doing. And at first, Mr. Gardner doesn't want to let him because he wants to be the one helping his niece and like be of use to her because of, you know, pride. Yeah, basically, it's like, no, this is my family. This is my problem. You're just a kind stranger. I should not let you pay this money. The vibe that I was getting from this whole thing was them like fighting over the bill at dinner. Oh, absolutely. No, let me. No, please. Absolutely. (laughs) And Mrs. Gardner, she says that he was very obstinate in that he's going to pay. And she says, I fancy, Lizzie, that obstinacy is the real defect of his character. After all, nothing was to be done that he did not do himself. So then they decide on the agreement that Darcy's going to pay it all, but they're going to say that Mr. Gardner did it so that nobody will know. They don't really say why they want that to be the case, but that's what happened. So all the debts are paid, and it amounts to, like, over 2,000 pounds in that time. Yes. And for our listeners, we just recorded uh, something on Patreon that involved converting early 19th century pounds to U.S. dollars today. And it was a headache and a half. So, so we're going to not do that now. Can we just assume 2,000 pounds in the 18 teens is a lot? Yeah. Then Mrs. Gardner again implies that Darcy had another interest in the affair, and that's why he wanted to do this. Then she says she tried to get Lydia to understand the wickedness of this whole situation. And I assume this is the part where Lydia was only hearing one in 10 words <laughs> and not listening. Mrs. Gardner says it was lucky if she heard any of it. And then Darcy comes back for the wedding and he dines with them. And Mrs. Gardner says, will you be very angry with me, my dear Lizzie, if I take this opportunity of saying what I was never bold enough to say before, how much I like him? (sighs) And then she... (laughs) Mrs. Gardner voicing the thoughts of literary fans for generations. Yes. And the end of this is everything. She says the only thing that he wants in a character is some liveliness and that if he marries prudently... Then his wife shall fix that for him. And then she says, Please don't exclude me from Pemberley, for I shall never be quite happy till I have been all round the park. A low phaeton, that's a kind of carriage, with a nice little pair of ponies would be the very thing. Basically saying, when you're married to him, Lizzie, make sure you invite me over a lot. The gardeners are all of us shipping Lizzie and Darcy. They're iconic. They're so Team Dizzy, it's crazy. I love it. So Lizzie gets all a flutter over how good Darcy is is as a human she also needs the chaise long to swoon onto at oh, this point does. in time 
And she can't help but hope that he's done this all for her, which we all know he has. But she doesn't let herself believe that because he could never want to be Wickham's brother-in-law. Plus, his reason for actually doing this was a good reason. He did believe himself to have caused this, and he had, quote, liberality, which is the ability to give and spend freely, so why not spend it on this? Now they owe everything to him, and she regrets every saucy speech she'd ever directed towards him. But Lizzie, your saucy speech is your bread and butter. (laughs) It's true. That's why he loves you. She's also proud of him, and she loves that her aunt and uncle like him. And then Wickham comes up behind her, and he's like, I'm interrupting you. And she says, yes, you are. (laughs) And she says it's not unwelcome, but it totally is. And I hate that she has to be nice to him now. Yeah, it's really not fun that she has to, like, be polite because he's her brother-in-law. Right. He brings up that she visited Pemberley, and he asks about Mrs. Reynolds, saying she was always very fond of him, which is (laughs) funny because Lizzie says, yeah, she was worried you didn't turn out well. And that was her response to that. Mrs. Reynolds was like, yeah, he sucks. Yeah, we know that she doesn't like him. So I remember a situation and I will not say who or even like which area of school it was where I knew this really arrogant guy. And he was like, oh, yeah, this professor just loves me. And he would talk all the time about how this female professor loved him. And one time I caught her saying something so savage about him. And I was like, oh, Oh, you got this wrong, hun. Oh, my God. And I feel like that's exactly the vibe of Wickham right now. He's like, oh, yeah, she's so charmed by me. Mm -hmm. And she, like, sees right through him. Yeah, and then he's like, uh, oh, let me change this subject. So he does. And he says that he was surprised to see Darcy in London. And he wonders what he's doing there. But, like, Wickham, shut the fuck up. You know what he was doing there because he just gave you a lot of money. She says perhaps he's preparing for his marriage to Mr. Berg. What? Lizzie, shut up. Then he asks if she saw him when she visited Pemberley, and she says he did. He introduced us to his sister. And then Wickham asks if she likes Georgie, and I just want him to get her name out of his mouth. I was so grossed out at this part. Like, how dare you even talk about her at all? We protect. We attack. We know that Wickham ain't no snack. Wickham ain't no snack. And Lizzie says that she likes her very much, and he says, well, when I last saw her, she was not very promising. That is so disgusting. Also, it just, like... It's gross. It's one of those, like, really misogynistic douche things where a guy, like, gets rejected by someone or breaks up with someone and then is like, oh, yeah, she's a fat bitch anyway. Like, that's what yeah. that's what's here. Yeah, it was infuriating. And then he asked if they visited Kimpton, which they didn't, and he says that was supposed to be his living. And he says that he very much would have liked the life of giving sermons and, and living there and taking care of the property and all of that. And Lizzie calls him out, and she's like, I actually have it on good authority that the living was conditional only, and there was a time in your life when you weren't so keen on giving sermons as you now seem to be. She is so not tolerant of his bullshit anymore. No, I love it. It's so good. So then he's like, uh, no... Wait, and she's like walking really fast to try to get rid of him. And then they get to the house and she's like, you know what? Let's not quarrel about the past. You know, we're siblings now and all of that. And then he awkwardly kisses her hand. And that's the end of that chapter. Yes, it is. That brings us to chapter 11. Wickham and Lizzie never bring up this conversation again. And then it's time for them to go. Wickham and Lydia. And Mr. Bennett does not want to go visit them. So it's going to be like at least a year until they see Lydia again. But when they ask Lydia how long it'll be, she's like probably two or three years because she sucks. And Mrs. Bennett says, write to us. And she says, you know, it's going to be really hard to write since I'm a married woman now. What does she think married women do? Literally, what do they do, especially in this time period? She and Wickham must be keeping up like a pretty robust sexual schedule. Yeah. That's just keeping her preoccupied. Oh, absolutely. What else would this relationship be founded upon? She says that her sisters can write to her because they have nothing else to do. (sighs) Also, they have more to do. Even like the logic of it is like they have to spend time finding husbands. Exactly. But alas, then Wickham just, you know, stands there and looks pretty while this is all happening. And Mr. Bennett says, after they leave, he is as fine a fellow as ever I ever saw. He simpers and smirks and makes love to us all. I am prodigiously proud of him. He's joking. (laughs) Good, thank you. I wrote he's joking, right, in my notes, so I'm glad you caught that. Never forget Daddy Bennett, for all of his flaws, is the king of sarcasm. It's amazing. Unreal. Perfect. Mrs. Bennett is really sad that her daughter has left, and Lizzie's like, well, let this be 
a warning to you. This is what happens when you marry off your daughters. They leave. And Mrs. Bennett's like, no, no, it's only because his regiment is so far away. Like, if that wasn't the case, she would be here longer and all of this stuff. And her spirits are then turned around when we find out that Bingley is coming back to Netherfield at long last. (laughs) Mrs. Bennett's all in the fidgets as it says in the book, and I love that. I am also all in the fidgets. I mean, I am also all in the fidgets, but I am in a closet. Same. We're all getting the fidgets from being locked up at Longbourn. God, I want to go outside. It's fine. So Mrs. Phillips comes to tell her this, and Mrs. Bennett's like, well, 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 he's coming back. Not that I care. We don't need him anyway, but who knows what might happen? You never know, but like, not that it matters. And are you absolutely sure that he's coming? And He is. And reading this part where she's just like being prime Mrs. Bennett, I realized something. I think that (laughs) the reason that I hate on Mrs. Bennett so much is because I see so much of myself in her. And, you know, when you see the worst parts of yourself in someone. I mean, Mrs. Bennett can be quite relatable. Like, this is quintessential. Like, oh, my ex is coming back. I don't care. But I don't care. Do I look okay? In completely unrelated news, I'm going to go put on a full face of makeup. Yep. And uh, my best bra. And uh, I'm also going to make sure that I, you know, show up there looking fine, sexy, fierce, but also like on the arm of my hot and sexy significant other and just like, you know, really rub it in their face. Like, I don't care, though. Like, are you sure he said he was coming? Like, I, that's so weird. Why would he even come now? Like, I don't even know, you know? End quote, Jane Austen. <laughs> It is confirmed that he will be there either on Wednesday or Thursday. And Jane says to Lizzie that she knows that she appeared distressed when she found this news out, but really she's fine. Jane is also doing that, but in like a Jane way. She's like, no, I'm fine. In a very silent way. I just like, I'll be happy to see him again. It's fine that he doesn't want me. I'll suffer in silence. She's mostly glad that he's coming alone because otherwise they'd be like inviting them over all the time and stuff like that. So that means they'll see less of him. Lizzie knows that he still likes her, but she can't really say anything about that. And she also wonders at this moment, I was wondering what she means by this. It says she still thought him partial to Jane and she wavered as to the greater probability of his coming there with his friend's permission or being bold enough to come without it. Does she think that Darcy has like totally flipped the switch on Bingley's relations to the Bennett family because of his feelings for Lizzie? I think that the question here is whether or not it was the fact that Darcy's saying you can go now that makes him come back or whether or not it's Bingley finally being so sappily in love with Jane that he comes back on his own. And she's kind of hoping that Darcy said you should go now. Or do you think it's the other? I mean, I'm asking you, which do you think it is? I think she really hopes that Darcy said you can go now because that would mean that he would go now too. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, oh, if you think Bingley can marry into the family, maybe you think that you can marry into the family as well. But his situation's a bit more complicated because of the whole Wickham situation. No joke, yeah. But anyway, Jane really just wants to leave him alone since he's only trying to come and hunt at his own house and he should be able to do that in peace. Mrs. Bennett tells Daddy Bennett that he must go visit Bingley when he comes in a lovely mirroring of the first chapter of this book. And Mr. Bennett is like, nope. Definitely not. Last time you told me I had to go visit him and you said he would marry one of my daughters and it just didn't end that way. So I'm not going to do it again. Can we talk about how exhausted Mr. Bennett is at this point in the book? He's tired. He needs a nap so badly. (laughs) And he says if Bingley wants to see them, he knows where they live and he can come visit them himself. (laughs) Unbelievable. She says that she'll ask him to come to dinner anyway because they are going to have Mrs. Long and the Goulding's over anyway. So there will be one seat for him. Jane hates everything about this, and she really actually wishes that he weren't coming at all because she can't bear to hear everyone talk about it all the fucking time. Then, it's the third day after he arrives at Netherfield, and Bingley is seen riding towards the house. So Mrs. Bennet calls everyone to the window, and Jane stays seated at the table, but Lizzie is like, all right, I'll go. She goes to the window, and she sees him riding towards the house with Mr. Darcy, and she turns right back around and sits down next to Jane. <laughs> The two of them are just like, oh, God. Also, it does not clarify that they are on two horses. So I'm going to continue the headcanon that they are on one horse. Oh, my God. Darcy and Bingley on a horse. We love to see it. I miss that. I just love the idea of Lizzie and Jane being like, nope, and sitting at the table while everyone else is crowded around the window. And then Kitty says, isn't that Mr. What's-His-Name? 
How do they not remember? That is Kitty's best line in the book. Best line in the book. Mr. What's his name? She calls him like proud and annoying or something like that. But how do they not remember his name? They loved to talk shit about him just like a year ago. I mean, if you remember, Jane and Lizzie spent significantly more time with the Bingleys mm, true. than Kittya did. Kittya was like pretty officer focused at that point in time. That's true. And Mrs. Bennett is like, well, yeah, but he is Mr. Bingley's friend. So I'll be nice to him, but only that far. And Lizzie and Jane are both super uncomfortable. And Jane doesn't really know the full reason of why Lizzie is. She knows that he's someone whose proposal she refused and then she found out that he was actually a good guy but she doesn't know everything with the money because Lizzie hasn't told her yet and maybe isn't gonna tell her who knows and the full reason why Lizzie feels uncomfortable is to her own more extensive information he was the person to whom the whole family were indebted for the first of benefits and whom she regarded herself with an interest if not quite so tender as at least as reasonable and just as what Jane felt for Bingley. <sighs> she really hopes that he came there to see her, but she doesn't know what to expect and she doesn't want to like let herself get too hopeful. Have you ever like mutually crushed? Like you and your friend have crushes on two people who are in a different group of friends and then you show up at the same party and you both like together are like, ah! you mean all of high school? Yeah, basically. When there was a girlfriend group and a guy friend group and I was still pretending to be straight. Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, this this has continued on. There was one time I was out at a bar with a few of my friends after college and we ran into two guys that we had been with in college and we were like, oh, God, they're together. We need to run. Ah! <laughs> That's really funny. In high school, we had these things called Mark Hannah sleepovers where Hannah lived on one side of the street and Mark lived on the other side of the street and the girlfriend group would go sleep over at Hannah's house and the guy friend group would go sleep over at Mark's house and we would hang out in the middle of the street. Escandal. Oh wait, Graham, the music. Escandal. Anyway, the men come in and Lizzie barely looks at Darcy, but she's listening to his voice and he sounds pretty much how he used to sound when he was at Hertfordshire before very awkward and quiet and not so much like he had been at Pemberley, which was like eager to please. Mrs. Bennett is really nice to Bingley and really cold to Darcy, which makes both Lizzie and Jane quite uncomfortable. This for Lizzie is a really high stakes situation. Remember, from Mrs. Bennett's perspective, this is just a guy who was shitty to one of her daughters. Right. Mr. Darcy, and who's been cold and proud to her the entire time. So she doesn't have incentive to be nice to him. From Lizzie's perspective, not only is this a man who has proposed marriage to her, but a man she's in love with and... A man who has saved her mother and her sisters and her father from absolute ruin. Yeah. So this dynamic is very weird. And then you have Darcy, who did the saving, who dislikes Mrs. Bennet, but who really adores Lizzie. And so, like, this is a lot of rubber bands being pulled as taut as they can. It is layered. Yes. Like an onion. Like an onion. Or a cake. Or a cake. We love cake. We do. Darcy asks Lizzie about the gardeners, and she's kind of like, you would know better than me, but she tells him they're good. And then he gets really quiet, and Lizzie keeps sneaking little peeks at him, and she finds him looking equally as much at Jane as looking at her, and otherwise he's just looking at the ground. So basically he's trying not to show any emotion whatsoever. That's his MO. <laughs> Always. And Lizzie was disappointed and angry with herself for being so. Big mood. Yep. She only wants to talk to him, but she's too nervous so all she can do is ask how Georgie is and then Mrs. Bennett gives Bingley a whole update on their lives mainly about Lydia's now being married to Wickham and she ends by saying Wickham has some friends though perhaps not so many as he deserves which Lizzie gets very uncomfortable yet again because she knows that's really pointed at Darcy and Bingley says he'll be staying for a few weeks Mrs. Bennett says that he's welcome to come shoot on their property whenever he wants he's there to kill birds by the way. And <laughs> again with the fowl. We love the fowl in this time period. And the poultry, yeah. Lizzie's just getting more and more miserable and she's thinking to herself how she would rather just never see either of them ever again because it's too painful. <sighs> and the only good thing that she notices is Bingley is as in love with Jane as ever. Then they leave and Mrs. Bennett reminds them as they're leaving that Bingley promised to come to dinner before he went away and she hasn't forgotten this promise. So she invites them to dinner in a few days and Bingley looks silly 
at this, blushing and saying that he was prevented for coming back by work or business or... Mrs. Bennett just called him the fuck out. Yeah, she really did. And he's like, oh, God. And everyone else at this juncture knows why he didn't come back, or at least Lizzie does. Does Jane? Jane knows. No. <gasps> Jane doesn't know. No, <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> this is so awkward. Yeah. That's why she's like, oh, he doesn't like me. Oh, my God. I'm so uncomfortable. This is a very awkward moment. And Mrs. Bennett wanted to ask them to stay for dinner that very day, but she knew that no less than two courses could ever be acceptable for, quote, a man on whom she had such anxious designs or satisfy the appetite and pride of one who had 10000 a year. So she's got to get a, a fancy dinner for those guys. Everybody got to shave their legs for Bingley and Darcy to come back over. Everyone is shaving their legs. Unlike everybody else in 2020. Yeah, I don't think I've shaved my legs in like three years, but you know. Honestly, good for you. I'm very proud. This brings us to Becca's study questions. Woo! Yes, okay. So they're short this time, but I wanted to talk about Lydia's demeanor when she gets back. And we talked about this a little but like the mismatch between Lydia's reactions to things and the ruin of her reputation. And not only the ruin of her reputation, but also the desperate circumstances she's in now. She doesn't seem to have any sort of grasp on the fact that she's ruined her life. No. I wondered if you could speak to maybe what we learn about her and Wickham in their reactions to their marriage. They're like those people who you think are perfect from the outside and you think they must have it so good, but they don't, except they don't care that they don't. I think for me, like this just came to my mind, but they kind of, if this were 2020, I feel like Lydia would be an Instagram influencer mm -hmm. and that she would gram her relationship pretty hard with her husband. But she wouldn't actually have a good relationship. Exactly. Yes. What's interesting is that Lydia is like totally blissed out right now. Like she's like, I scored a husband. We are having great sex and we're moving far away from all of you. So I'm like a big girl now. Like she just is like really proud of herself for doing the thing. And Wickham doesn't have to put in much effort for her to be happy because he's just a man that she has scored and he's hot and he's not rich. Does she know that Darcy paid this money? I don't think so. So she just thinks that he's marrying her <laughs> for her. She just thinks he's in love with her. Right. And he doesn't have to do much to prove that for her self-esteem he sucks so hard seriously you just you know it's going to be an unhappy marriage and you know they're going to be poor but i think it is striking how happy they pretend to be or seem to be in this section it seems like the thing is it seems like they don't care about their own happiness like they don't care about their future lydia thinks that the future she's like oh i'm immortal i'm gonna live forever it's great wickham was prepared to, like, just have her for a nice little fuck and then go marry up somewhere. And he got paid off. And then he's like, all right. Yeah. He doesn't like her. I really do think it it mirrors sort of a polar opposite to Charlotte and Collins because Lizzie and Darcy live in this middle ground where there's a lot of love and romance, but it is also quite an economic benefit to Lizzie if she is able to match with Darcy. But... On one side, you have Collins and Charlotte, who you just know did it once, and Charlotte's been literally avoiding it ever since. But they have this, you know, they have this life they've put together. It's comfortable. They've got a garden. They've got money. They're in a good position socially. And then you have Lydia and Wickham, who seem to be in the sex bubble together, where they don't give a shit about anything except the fact that they get to grab at each other. And they have no money, no prospects. And basically, Lydia has been all but disowned by her family. And they don't seem to give a shit because they're just so into each other. Yeah. And I think that Jane Austen does a really good job balancing those two polar sides and pointing towards the couples we're supposed to root for as something a little bit more in the middle of those two things. What's frustrating is that if Lydia can marry Wickham, then of course, if Lizzie married Darcy, her family would be like ecstatic, except now Darcy will never marry her because of fucking Wickham. Ugh. Yes. I'm infuriated. So the revelation. Why did Darcy do this? We've got two theories forward. We've got because, well, we've got three theories you could put out there. We have because he feels guilty because the reason people don't know Wickham is a piece of shit is because Darcy hushed up that Wickham was a piece of shit to Georgie. And because Darcy kind of sucked when he arrived. Exactly. We have the fact that Darcy might want to, you know, make 
moves on Lizzie and he doesn't want her to be completely disadvantaged in society. And possibility number three is just that Lizzie's broken a little and he wants to help. I think it's a little bit of everything. I think, yes, it is his fault that nobody knew about Wickham. Yes, he... Oh, number three is is correct because he's a sweet baby boy and he cares about her, but also saving her from the reputational thing is an A-plus move on his part. I hadn't thought of that, actually. So clutch. This was such a clutch move on the part of uh, Fitzwilliam Darcy. But, so here's the thing. Now all of the problems with, like, connecting with a family that's in squalor status-wise, are all those problems are solved. The only thing that remains is that Wickham would be his brother-in-law. Indeed. Huh. So on the note of the first thing about Darcy hiding the Georgiana thing and blaming himself for what happened to Lydia, I want to flash back to when Lizzie first told Darcy what happened. How does that theory on the case throw that interaction into new light? She was like sitting there being like, oh, my God, I'm ruining my chances with him. Like her thoughts in that moment versus what his thoughts in that moment might be. So she knew she was ruining her chances with him. Because she was throwing her family into squalor. Remember, he showed up at her house in a carriage. She cried to him. And then he was like, I'll go get your aunt and uncle. And she was thinking, oh, I I appreciate him listening to how terrible this all is. But goodbye. He was like, we got to find her and fix this. Yeah. But the guilt he must have felt for this happening to Lizzie. Because she trusted Wickham. Oh. Because he didn't tell her right away. Right, because, okay, so I remember feeling really bad for him because it was like the thing that happened to my sister is happening to her sister. But the added layer of like, shit, because I didn't tell everyone what happened to my sister and also that Wickham sucks in general, this is now happening. And he wanted to fix it. Get ready to squee again. (laughs) Squee! All right, Lizzie's reaction to finding out about Darcy. We've been following this trajectory for like volume the third about going through Lizzie's evolution of her feelings for Darcy. Where are we? Oh my God. She is like passed out on the floor with all of the swooning she's doing. When she found out what he had done, her first response was, he did this for me. And then she was like, no, no, no. He couldn't have done it for you because he would have to marry into Wickham's family if he were to marry you. But then she saw him outside and she was like, is he here for me? And then she was like, no, no, no. He couldn't possibly be here for you. Lizzie, he's here for you. So for me personally, I think this is a real like point of no return for Lizzie Bennett and her heart and Mr. Darcy. Yeah. For me, this is the moment where like it all clicks into place for her in a big way. Yeah. I think she is still struggling to like allow herself to think that his love for her could overpower the obstacles, but he's proving it again and again. So I don't possibly see why she's confused other than a lack of self-esteem. Exactly. And Lizzie, come on. We know you're hot. This boy could not be clearer right now. He wants your booty so badly. (laughs) And he's actually being clear for once in his fucking life instead of standing awkwardly in the corner. Well, now he's standing awkwardly in the corner again. But for a minute there, he was like, let me be your knight in shining armor. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so Wickham's interaction with Lizzie at the end, how does this mirror their first conversation? Their first conversation? What happened in their first conversation? Think back to it. Lydia and Lizzie were fighting for his affections. Lydia walked away. Oh, yeah. And then they had a conversation about Wickham's living and Georgiana. Oh, yeah, and that's when he told her about Darcy being a dick. So the topics that come up here... To our listeners, they're cheering for the healthcare workers right now in New York City. So, like, just support your essential workers through this pandemic. And you'll probably hear a little background screaming. Yeah, but if you hear background screaming in this part, just know that it's for the people who work at the grocery stores and the hospitals and on the subways, like, putting their lives on the line for us. So we're cool with this background noise, okay? Yes, cool. and we cheer for them in our hearts while we record. Yeah, I, I usually I, I have cheered for them before. I'm just currently trying to give y'all the content that you so desperately want. That's so. good content. <laughs> what? I said the content. Exactly. The content. TM. So anyway, back to this question about Wickham and Lizzie. So the topics that come up in this conversation with them later, before Lizzie never sees Wickham again in the book. Fingers crossed. Or does she? <laughs> You'll never know. I will know eventually. <laughs> yes. But like this, this one where she's saying goodbye to him versus the first conversation they had. 
the topics overlap, but Lizzie's reaction to the topics is so different. Yes, because now she knows the truth, TM. Yes, she does. So I was wondering if you like had thought at all about the parallels and what it says about Lizzie, where she is in the story right now. Yeah, I mean, the first conversation that they had, I remember being like, what? And like getting so hyped to hate on Darcy and Lizzie being kind of hyped to hate on Darcy. With this. this was their favorite activity, if we'll remember back, was hating on Darcy. Truly. And talking about the living, she was like so buying into his whole story. Now, he asks her, did he tell you that it was conditional? And she was like, I have it on good authority. The good authority being Colonel Fitzwilliam, actually, sort of, because Darcy said, ask Colonel Fitzwilliam. <laughs> But really, it was Darcy. Yeah, no, she's basically saying, guess what, bitch? I don't believe you anymore. I believe him. And it's so cute. And I love that she shuts him down and that she's trying to get away from him while she's walking really fast. He's trying to bring back that original jibe, jiving. Jiving? Vibing. Yeah, he's, he's putting on all of his charms and they just don't work anymore. So good for Lizzie. Good for Lizzie. Fuck Wickham. Fuck Wickham. The next thing we have is the return of Jingly. Yeah! For all the fans out there, what's changed and what hasn't? So what hasn't changed is how Bingley feels about Jane and how Jane feels about Bingley. What has changed is that Jane thinks that Bingley doesn't like her. Yeah. Also, I think the other thing about this interaction is that now the Bennets are on guard Mm -hmm. and the sisters aren't there. The plastics. Oh, yeah. (gasps) Where are they? Just not there. They didn't come with. Huh. Yeah. The plastics were the the part that sucked the most out of this whole situation. They were the ones that wanted to talk shit about Jane and Lizzie and everyone. Now the boys are here. Bingley is so in love with Jane. And we can kind of glean that Darcy no longer thinks ill of him going after her. So a lot has changed. Hell yes. All right. That brings us to our next little questions. We have... Funniest quote. I'm so excited to announce, dear listeners, that for the first time ever, I have picked a funniest quote in advance. The mad shuffle to get a funniest quote happens every episode and is cut every episode. So this is a big deal for specifically me. And our patrons who get a lot of my pages turning in their outtakes. So this is when the boys are riding up on their horse, singular to the Bennett household and Mrs. Bennett and Katie are looking out the window. By the way, Mary is still not there. I mean, Mary is with her dead bugs. Right. And her Alanis Morissette and Simple Plan. Exactly. She is. She's fine. Yes. So uh, Mrs. Bennett and Katie are looking out the window like, who's that guy with him? Oh, that looks like uh, that weirdo. Oh, Mr. Darcy. And Mrs. Bennett says, well, any friend of Mr. Bingley's will always be welcome here, to be sure. But else I must say that I hate the very sight of him. This is such a perfect sandwich with, like, everything Mrs. Bennett has said about him from, like, literally our first episode. She hates him so much. The bitch cracker syndrome persists with her. But he makes 10000 a year, so she cannot possibly not let him into her home. Oh, exactly. And also he saved her entire family but that's a different story but she doesn't know that all right questions moving forward i don't think that lydia and wickham can possibly survive (laughs) this is actually just ends in a post-apocalyptic world where whittia whittia wickham (laughs) whittia whittia Whittia. where lydia and wickham are just like wandering the moors of england like searching for food and shelter that's exactly what i think is going to happen they do not know how to take care of themselves so that's a question i have moving forward is it's what's going to happen with them i imagine it'll be told like through letters or something will lizzie and darcy reveal their secret to the rest of the family slash the gardeners will they reveal that or will they keep it a secret forever or at least tell jane lizzie's got to tell jane i think that jane and bingley are going to get together pretty soon We don't have that many chapters left, so it has to happen. Does it? (laughs) It's gotta. Last question you have moving forward? I'm looking forward to this dinner in a few days. And who wins the chapters? Our baby boy, Darcy. I totally agree. This is definitely a clutch move on the part of Fitzwilliam Darcy. Not only does he do something deeply humanitarian for people he doesn't like, but also this is the first time he has shown any semblance of having any romantic game. Yeah. So good on you, Fitzwilliam. Yeah. We're so proud of you. 
Listeners, that concludes this episode of Pod and Prejudice. Until next time, stay proper. And find yourself someone like Darcy. Someone who makes you faint on a shillong. Bye. Bye. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our beautiful show art is designed by Torrance Brown. To learn more about our show and our team, you can check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you like what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us, or just drop us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.